Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the fourth episode of the story in which Naruto is civilian due to unforeseen circumstances, Naruto's life is derailed from his intended career. This story is from Ideas Maker, so please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Okay, that was unexpected, says the Toad San Nin. Having listened to the flashback involving his old teammate can do that, especially one that's Orochimaru. However, he then realized this isn't about his old ex-teammate. Thanks to that encounter, even someone like Jiraiya was sidetracked. Well you can't really blame him considering Orochimaru is after all Kanoha's number one enemy and he somehow found his way to Naruto before him. Massaging his temples, Jiraiya realized they are actually drifting from the main issue. Hence, he had to bring them back on track and focus on the problem on hand. Okay, never mind about my ex teammate. I was only shocked that he's somehow involved. He's not going to mention how his ex teammate beat him in finding his godson, let alone getting to him much earlier than he. Let's not get sidetracked. While my ex teammate is dangerous, he isn't the reason why I am here. The main reason why I am here is there's an organization looking for you. More specifically, they are targeting all the Jinchurikis such as yourself. I am sure even you can understand it's nothing good. Jiraiya was both glad and disappointed he isn't the one to tell him what it is. Naruto, I want you to listen to me. These people are dangerous, so in order to protect you I need you to come back to Konoha. No. Naruto responded adamantly. The steeled tone he used in his response spoke volumes as it's very clear by then that the Sanin's negotiation wouldn't go smoothly as he thought. I am done with the village. I like my life here. You don't have to be an expert in behavior analysis or body language to see how he felt against his home village. He wouldn't even call it by its name and Jiraiya can even see the slight twitch every time Kanoha is brought up. Unfortunately, despite time's calls for desperate measures, so he had to at least try. Look, the palace guards aren't equipped to handle these people. No offense to them but normal samurais probably wouldn't know they were there let alone fight against them. I don't want to frighten you but they are ruthless and would not stop until they have what they want. Sadly, his narrative had no effect on him as he stared back impassively. Hey kid, you need to listen. Please take this seriously because these people are all cage class ninja assassins. I am listening, if what you say is true. Just how many cage class ninjas does the village have? Seeing he's at least being reasonable, he answered truthfully. Well, there's myself. The Sandame and now Tsunade, she should be the new Hokage now. He had hoped the Hokage title would perk his interest but sadly he didn't seem to care. Only three? Out of the whole village? Well, there are others such as Kakashi and Might Guy. But they fell short on cage level but they are close. Kakashi was not very powerful near the beginning hence how he was captured by Zabuza. Similarly Might Guy is also around his level unless he use his gates. So he too isn't quite Kage level. Jiraiya want his trust, thus he's answering everything as honest as he can. Some might argue why Jiraiya couldn't just knock him out and take him like Orochimaru. The answer is simple, he couldn't. With the Fire Lord's involvement, that option is now impossible. After all, the man did order him to not force the issue. So, if Naruto suddenly disappear, regardless whether Kanoha's involved or not they would be his number one suspect. Then again, Jiraiya also want a close relationship with his godson thus he couldn't be too forceful. Sadly, Naruto isn't making it easy for him as he outright rejects the offer. No thanks, I rather take my chances. Why not? Please be reasonable, you are better off protected inside a ninja village. Jiraiya was hoping for an answer and he got one. Simple math, you said they are a group. Unless you are saying three is bigger than a group? I don't see how the village can seriously protect me. Let me explain, these Akatsuki only travel in pairs. 
any more, they would risk attracting attention. So unless you are actively looking for them, very few knew about their existence. If they choose to come anyway, our border patrols would notify the village and we will be well prepared. Three cage class ninjas may not be much, but ninjas isn't about strength. If you are a ninja, you will learn that strategy also plays a vital role when it comes to fighting. You may not know this, the Naras were well known for their intelligence and their clan head is also the village's strategist. Combined with home field advantage, I doubt Akatsuki would be careless enough to attack on our turf. Let it be known that at the time Jiraiya didn't know about pain or how powerful he is. He may know Nagato in his early years and know about his Rinnegan but at the time Nagato didn't know how to use them. Later Jiraiya thought he had died in the skirmish against Hanzo of the Salamander. Thus, as far as Miss Singnins go, the Toad Sanin is confident the three cage-class ninjas and the village combined would be enough to combat the Akatsuki. Under normal circumstances and from a realistic point of view, he would be right and isn't being arrogant. Unless it's Hanzo of the Salamander, Madara or Hashirama Senjua like coming back from the dead, there aren't many that can take on the leaf. Otherwise, you will need another ninja village. Jiraiya knew this and so did Orochimaru, as do most ninjas. So as you can see, from a military point of view you will be well protected, then he added. You may not know this, aside from the famous quote, Will of Fire, Kanoha ninjas were well known to never abandon one another. Aside from the explanation, the Toad Sanin hoped to teach his godson the core value of the ninja village. Unfortunately, he forgot whom he's talking to as what he said after made him wince. Don't forget, Jiraiyazan. I was from the same village and I was abandoned. Despite how causal it had sound, the Sanin couldn't help but tasting the venom through those words. No matter how much he wishes to deny it, the boy was not wrong. The kid wasn't just abandoned, he was framed and then literally forgotten by the village. Noon did a thing, not even the clan heads. They threw him to the wolves and pretend it didn't happen. His godson clearly understood this and so did Jiraiya, hence why that response stung so much. Unfortunately, he wasn't finished. Besides, if I go with you I will most likely die by your ninja's hands before the Akatsuki get theirs on me. Although shocked, Jiraiya couldn't deny it as he remembered his past reports. His abuser wasn't just the civilians, as ninjas and clans too were somehow involved. Not only that, even the village's medical units too went against their professional code of conduct and gave him less than the necessary treatment. With Tsunade back in the village and as Hokage, she will no doubt make sure fitting punishment is dealt, it won't change what had happened. Solemnly the Toad Sanin had to admit. To be honest. Before coming here, I read your reports. While I can't undo the wrongs, however I can promise you, you will not be ostracized as long as I am alive. It will be different this time and they will have to get through me. It may sounded perfect through his mouth but our hero wasn't fooled. Right. Who's going to stop them when you went off to fight this Akatsuki? You think you can watch and protect me 24-7? Seven days a week? 365 days a year, the blonde inquires. The silence was clear as the Sanin obviously hadn't thought about how he can uphold that promise. As much as he hated, somehow he's losing an argument, to a pre-teen Nolus. That's another jab to his ego, then again what's being said sounded very much like a very personal experience. Did his godson went through this kind of life in prison or the village? All right, I admit that came out wrong he's obviously trying to salvage the situation. While it's true I can't be there every day, I know others I trust to watch over you. The moment he said that, even he realized how weak that sounded. Here, he's trying to get the kid to trust him but in the end he's passing the responsibility to someone else. No, like I said. I am fine where I am and I will not go back to my old life. Jiraiya knew then he had lost the argument. Sighing in defeat, it's back to square one. Unlike his father, the kid isn't naive and trusting so he had to switch tactics. 
Look, I am not forcing you. I am just saying you have a better chance inside a ninja village than in the capital. Instead of pushing, he's now taking a step back. All I am asking is for you to think about it. Too bad Naruto had already made up his mind and had very little tolerance for small talk so he cut right to the chase. Why? To be locked up like an animal? Horrified, the Sanin quickly deny it. No. Heavens, no. You are free to go wherever you want. I doubt that, I sincerely doubt the rest of the villagers will think that way. Especially your council. You don't have to be a ninja to see the wince in the Sanin when the council is brought up. Ignoring the surprised look, the blonde continued. Especially when I am behind the village's walls. I doubt my so-called freedom will be as you say it would be. He's again right, and the Sanin curse himself for not thinking about that. Unknown to him, the Fire Lord had explained to his godson about jurisdictions and rights. As an artist, he will be dealing with a lot of royalties. Hence, the daimyo had to teach him a little politics. Considering whom he is, Yuzu painter, he had to constantly remind him whom he can deal his business with. This includes associations with his old village. Naruto is a very special case because he's considered as a ward of two states. This means on official papers both sides will have claims to him. Since he's born in Kanoha, the village will have control over his inheritance. That will be politics as the two sides will have to negotiate. Hence, our hero understand very well what will happen when he's behind the ninja village's walls. Currently, the ninjas have no claim on him. However, if he chose to voluntarily move back, he will become Kanoha's responsibility. Everything is politics because it's the binding agreement that kept them running smoothly this long. Jiraiya's heart is perhaps in the right place, but with the elders on Kanoha's council. Even the Sanni knew they will be his biggest obstacles in protecting his godson. He also knew very well, once Naruto returns, there will be very little he can do. He's feeling very conflicted, is he protecting his godson or damning him? He doesn't want to lie but Naruto had pointed out is again very true. If this group do come, I say let them come. Jiraiya want to protest but his godson didn't let him. I rather live freely than be put in a prison again. Dot. It's difficult to see whether he meant it, prison, in a literal sense or just a figure of speech, Jiraiya had a feeling he meant both. However, what had he more concerned about is whether he meant Kanoha as his prison or that there will be a prison waiting for him? Considering whom are on the Elder Council, the Sanmin knew what his godson had said weren't completely untrue. Sunda is maybe a Hokage but Kanoha's system isn't entirely a dictorship because as Itachi in the manga quotes, you don't become the Hokage to be acknowledged by everyone. The one who is acknowledged by everyone becomes the Hokage. Hence, while Tsunade has the power to make decisions but if she can't convince the clans and the local population, she's no different to an empty figurehead. Then again, this is one of those never-ending, what-if, scenarios because you won't know what happened until you are there. So instead of worrying, he chose to focus on his objective and that is to convince his godson to return. Sadly, the source of all this is all because of hate. As much he want to tell him to let go that grudge he couldn't. Had the kid been a ninja, he may have to shoulder that responsibility but the reality is he isn't. In Kanoha's eyes he's branded a criminal, a clan killer which makes him an enemy of the village. It wasn't just boy that is pissed, even the easygoing toad wanted to find those responsible and rip them into shreds. Hence, he couldn't even ask him to let go that hate. This is especially the case when you consider why such demand is placed on a young child when the adults couldn't control theirs. There are so much he wanted to tell him, to teach him and to guide him but because of the village he couldn't. He couldn't tell him where his name, Naruto, came from. The name came from his first book which his parent named their child. It was their hope to see their son striving for peace like the character in his book. During his time in Kanoha, he had read his godson's past reports and saw the similarities between him and the character from his fictional book. 
At the time of writing, his character while inspired by orphans from war, it was nevertheless imaginary. Hence, seeing it come alive and coming from his home village gave him mixed feelings. War was hell and the Sanin had witnessed it with his own eyes, but the sickening treatment on his godson pales in comparison. He didn't know which was worse, running away from deadly ninjas in a war-torn country or living in a village where most villagers are plotting your death. Like the, the Naruto character from his book, his godson ignore his hatefully treatments and push forth. He had his sights set on the ninja academy, hoping one day he can prove himself by protecting even those that wronged him. Jiraiya knew this because it's also written in the Sandames report. What people didn't know is that Naruto isn't the Hokage's favorite because of his Jinchuriki status. He was his favorite because of his noble attitude. By conversing with him nearly every day, the Sandame can sense what a noble heart he has in such young age. It was for this reason that the Hokage took an addition interest in his future. Call it an investment if you will, Naruto is maybe young but it's rare to see someone's will being this strong. It may seem cruel but Naruto's situation is like trial by fire. The ninja world is cruel, so if Naruto can get through this by himself he will be tougher later in life. Hence, he had ninjas kept an eye on him and only intervene when he's in danger. However, what he couldn't anticipate is how far his people would go about ruining the boy's career. Like the Hokage, Jiraiya too can see underneath the underneath. The Sandame was very through in his report as it includes his godson's mental state. Had it been anyone, they would have long been broken or given up. Unfortunately, because of that one event he was forever cast away from that chance. However, what riled the Sandine up so much was how it was accomplished. It smells so much like the crippled councilman that he almost jumped to confront him. What stopped him is the war hawk's usual signature that everything he does is one or another benefit the village. Strangely, sending Kanoha's Jinchuriki to prison seemed very opposite to what the councillor would do. Upon finding out that this was all the civilian council's doing made him beyond furious. Not only did they meddle themselves in shinobi affairs that shouldn't concern them, they even perverted Kanoha's justice system so they can get their way. What's more unforgivable is that the victim isn't just any nobody. They locked away the fourth Hokage's son, the last clan heir of Uzumaki, his godson and the village's protector, Jinchuriki. Fools, imbeciles, dimwits. He continued with all kinds of insults to describe them. He wanted to wriggle the necks of those responsible but according to the reports he will be wriggling over half of the village's necks. He too now can see the frustration the Hokage felt when this happened, yet powerless to do anything. Sighing to himself, he thought. Naruto would have been perfect. He's the tragic hero like in his story, the perfect main character to turn that his fiction story into reality. He would also be his last student and he had high hopes that Minato's son would be the prophecy child. Now Jiraiya didn't know what to think. Was the prophecy just a fool's dream? Can peace not truly be achieved? Ninjas are more than just assassins, at least that's what Jiraiya the Sanin believes. Its kanji roughly translates as one whom endure, some thinks it's enduring their ruthless training or missions. However, see it differently. He thinks they are someone who can endure the world, someone whom can handle anything that life or nature throw at them. Their extraordinary powers weren't for selfish reasons like war, instead they were meant for something greater. They were his ideals, an ideal shared by two Hokages, the Sandame and the fourth which is his student. It was also the reason Minato and Kushina named their son after the character from his book. Whether he can bring peace like Naruto in the book doesn't matter but as parents they want him to be strong and live his life like the fictional character. Sadly the two died on the day of his birth so Noon can tell him why they gave him that name. What Noon knew was they did leave something for him. However, what they couldn't anticipate was the village not training him in ninja art. Minato had added a contingency plan to help his son in event the QB escapes but since Naruto is a civilian and can't access that chakra the seal held on much longer. 
Noon knows its limit, could be years, could be centuries or even more, the same can be said for Kushina as hers would only appear when it's time for him to steal the fox's power. Hence, their essence went dormant to God knows when it would be used. The reason Jiraiya is so fixate on him is because he sees him as the hero he was meant to be. Even without help and guidance, his godson is like the will of fire incarnate that the village ninjas are so proud of seeing themselves having but were too blind to see it in him. Countless times, they tried to extinguish and douse that fire by their horrendous treatment. Yet, his fire continues to burn until they conspire against him. Even then his fire hadn't quite died until he was forgotten by the very people he cared about. The day he painted Kanahagakur was also the day that fire died thus became the monument everyone in fire prison witnessed. Of course, Jiraiya doesn't know about the wall. That does not stop him from asking himself that question. Why am I protecting these fools? Deep down he's having doubts, but he's no traitor. He proved that when he stopped himself from leaving during the Orochimaru mess. Kid, I won't tell you what to do or how to live your life. However, there's a saying among us ninjas. In our line of work, we ninjas don't expect to live a long life. So what we do is treat every day as our last and live it without regret. Having said that, Jiraiya felt little proud for coming up with such line. Unfortunately, his godson thought otherwise. You are right, but that is only if you are truly living a life instead of being caged. That response struck him like lightning as the Sanin had to look in his godson's eyes. Did he use it as a figure of speech? Or was he talking about his emprisement? Nevertheless, his use of being caged alerted of the village elders. As much as he don't want to think about it, it's still a possibility. Considering who else is on the elder council, it's a very high possibility. Okay, one problem at a time. First he will need to first convince his godson, he will worry about the elders later. He assume he's only using it as a figure of speech because he wouldn't know about the elders. Then again, with him personally watching over him he doubt they can try anything. Like he thought to himself, one problem at a time. Unfortunately, his biggest challenge at the moment is to talk some sense into his godson. The short time he got to know him made him realize he would have a better chance moving the Hokage mountain with his own hands. Sighing to himself. Kid, I know what you went through, what the villagers did was beyond despicable. I am not asking you to forget or forgive these people, but don't let the past ruin your future. Like what I said, we ninjas have short lives, only a lucky few gets to live to an old age. If you stay here and when those guys with blue cloaks and red clouds finally show up, it would be too late. Unknown to Jiraiya, what he just said triggered a reaction in him. However, what followed shocked him. You mean someone like Sasori and Daidara? What? How do you know about them, then he realized something. They were here? Oh, they come around every now and then. What and? Why? Jiraiya's clearly horrified. Why not? They like art and I am an artist. So we got along well. The Sanmin wanted to pull his hair out, he's trying to keep them away and hear his godson literally open his door wide welcoming them. He wanted to scream, he wanted to scold him or even reprimand him. But he had to keep his cool. Don't you know they are Miss Singnans? Should I? That stopped him, and Jiraiya just realized he's not talking to a shinobi. The kid's a civilian, of course he wouldn't know about Miss Singnans. Now he think about it, it seems he's the one that's overreacting. So after calming himself, he responded. Eh. Never mind. Seeing he isn't missing a limb or got himself captured, something must had happened that's beyond his understanding. They were the Akatsuki, so unless his was wrong he's definitely missing something. Just tell me, did you invite them in? Sure, why not? They are my friends. Friends? He's friends with notorious missingnans? Suddenly, he had a sinking feeling in his gut. 
he had to once again compose himself before asking him another question. Just how long have you known them? Just maybe he can still savage the whole situation and give him a little lesson in not letting strangers into his own house. We had been in touch for five years. That's when he realized he himself is more of a stranger than those two. The saddest part is through his godson's eyes he can also see how much of a stranger he is to him. He's only his godfather in name, because he was never there for him. Everyone can make excuses but the fact is he's very much of a stranger. With his shoulders now slack he says. I suppose you are going to tell me what happened. If it will help me get rid of you. Sure. At this point, it's abundantly clear that Jiraiya still hadn't told him who he is to him. To Naruto, all he need to know is that this man's from Konoha and that's enough. He may appear civil, but deep down he doesn't want anything tied to the village. The reason he's still talking is because he didn't know how to outright say no. Hashtag 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 flashback Sasori and Daydara hashtag 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 little did anyone knew, Orochimaru wasn't the first to find him. Apparently, Sasori and Daydara got there long before even Kabuto found out about him. Very few know it, Yura Yura, Kazakage's advisory council, isn't Sasori's only sleeper agent. It made sense, for someone known to control over a hundred of puppets, having more than one sleeper agent isn't a big deal. At least in this story, he will have multiple such agents across the elemental nation. Like Yura, the host may not be aware until the jutsu is activated. Its ingenious thus prevent itself from being discovered. So unless you know what to look for, even experts in major villages will know there's a spy among them. Additionally, the activation sequence can also be auto-triggered. Once relevant or specific information is intercepted, the jutsu would activate thus allow the agent to pass along the information. The moment demon or QB is mentioned within these agents' earshot, the information is as good as in Sasori's pockets. So the question is how are the information passed over while the agent is in jail? The answer is in his information network, it's called network for a reason and Sasori had to establish nodes, connection point, for his information to flow. He may or may not had intended to target the prison for information but since one of his idiot agent managed to get himself in one. The puppet master had a choice, to either drop him or establish a connection. Obviously, he chose the latter. While a prison isn't an ideal place for information because of its isolation but you never know what kind of information can be secretly exchanged. That's how he found out about the Kyubi Jinchuriki. However, what he didn't expect was to find out he's also this mystery painter that everyone's been searching all over the elemental nation. He didn't immediately report it because the nine-tailed beast isn't his responsibility. He may bring it up in their next meeting but in the meantime his priority is on the Achibi. Thanks to Yura, sleeper agent, on the council, Sasori knew everything about his home village. This means he knew everything about the museum and the village's transformation. However, what he couldn't understand is how this is all because of one painting. To say that he's not curious would be wrong, but he didn't make it as his priority. That is until he had another argument with his partner where he suggests for a third person's opinion. Yeah right, whom would be qualified enough to judge us? How about that mystery artist that the whole elemental nation is searching for? Mystery artist? Who are we talking about? You don't know? There's only one known work confirming his existence and it's sitting in Suna. You're talking about the Desert Lotus? It know about that? I was meaning to sneak a peek the next time we are in the village then the mad bomber realized something. Wait a minute. He, he just realized his partner somehow knew he's a male. Yeah, the painter is a he. I happen to have his intel by chance, along with his whereabouts. Since we are already near Suna, why don't we stop for a look? Like his partner, he too was a little curious. Good idea we should check out his work before letting him judge ours. He better live up to my standard. 
With Sasori in the lead, the two easily found themselves within walls of the ninja village. So without anyone noticing, the two Akatsuki members found their way to their target. While the museum maze is impressive, using his puppet scouts it wasn't too difficult. Despite taking at least over an hour, the two were nevertheless were amazed by the innovative structure design. Thankfully, since they start in the middle of night, around three, they have all the time they need. Once they arrive, like those seeing it the first time they too were captivated by its essence. While the museum is close, the painting is still illuminated by dim light. This however does not diminish its beauty or effect as the two unconsciously leap back a few meters. They were surprised all right, as it feel like they were literally sucked in by the painting. The foo asterisk asterisk happened? It's like we were being pulled in? My senses tells me otherwise, but at the same time you are not wrong. How peculiar. This phenomenon greatly perked the puppeteer's interest as he didn't hesitate to try again. Seeing his partner step forth again, Daidara too didn't back down. Since it isn't affecting them physically, they too assumed it somehow worked like an optical illusion. True to their belief, the painting is harmless but its effects are beyond anything they had ever experienced. Before they knew it, they found themselves lost in the night lotus world. By the time they came to, they stumbled to orientate themselves. You guys must be new. Don't worry, it does that to you sometimes. Out of reflex, the two found themselves staring at the speaker. Since when did he get here, that's where the mad bomber recognized whom he is thus whispered to his partner. Isn't he soon as Jinchuriki? What the hell is he doing here? Sasori didn't immediately respond but he too recognized the red head thus connect him to the reports. I heard he spends most of his time here in the museum. Sasori too whispers in an almost silent tone. It's beautiful, isn't it? Gara continued, not caring they were listening or not. The two didn't know how to respond but someone beat them to it. It sure is, young Gara. That's when they realized they weren't that alone and the Jinchuriki isn't the only one with them. To their shock, they found themselves surrounded. Now they understood why there's that much space around one painting. However, what surprised them most is why they are still so calm and not feeling the urge to run. The civilians may not know whom they are but there's a very high chance Gara recognized them, especially the puppet master. Don't mind us, injected another new voice. By now, nothing can surprise them any more as they turn to the new speaker. Why are everyone coming over? They are virtually strangers, hence the two couldn't understand why this is happening. However, what is said next explained a little. We recognize a fellow art lover when we see one, let alone two. We always welcome more members to talk about art. Daydara couldn't help but ask. How do you know we like art? You know we are new. That's easy, we all fell to the same effect that painting gives. The moment you submerge into that world, we immediately knew how much you love art. It's not often different people can come to the same understanding. However, through that conversation the two couldn't help but find themselves nodding truthfully. Deep down, the two found themselves unconsciously liking this group. Another presence too made his presence known. I am here every day and I don't think I could ever get bored seeing it over and over. Damn. Everyone keeps sneaking in without us knowing. Since when did this old man been sitting there? Despite that thought, Daydara wasn't really mad. Although the original plan was to sneak in and out before being seen. However, because of the odd circumstances they were in they found themselves mingling with the crowd. You know, Garadono was the one that could connect with the painting on a deeper level than any of us. Really? How so? Having heard that, the puppeteer is curious. His first dive was quite an eye-opener and he thought he had quite an understanding. He was the first to think about loneliness. You are right, I am surprised how I missed that, then he had to wonder. I wonder why. About that, we are all still debating if it belonged to the Night Lotus or its creator. 
As an artist himself, Sasori too heard how the creator's conscious or feeling can sometimes be transferred to a creation. Sadly like everyone else he had only heard them in legends. Anyway, the mystery is driving most of us nuts. The Kazakage may have given up on finding the painter but we will continue the search without him. It was true as most villages too decline such missions unless they are desperate for money. Hence, without them knowing Sasori and Daydara found themselves enjoying these people's company. Again without them knowing they were there every day for at least a week. Unfortunately for them, while everyone they talked to enjoys art they were uncomfortable in talking about their own art. They knew because they had given subtle hints here and there trying to probe these people without giving away their identity. Having been here for some time, I am surprised that there's no puppet here in Suna Museum. It's not surprising, in Suna puppets are represents war. No matter how elegant it is, the moment it stains blood it loses its value. It's no different to a second-hand item. However, over time it may have its historical value but is it truly artistic? While the response isn't something he wanted to hear but Sasori can understand what he's saying. Unfortunately despite what's being said made sense, he was left still unsatisfied. On the other hand, Daydara too received similar responses on his ideal of a blast, art. The two may get along with these people because of art, but none of them seem to understand their passion. Why can't anyone understand? Just when they are about to be disappointed, their eyes caught on to the night lotus, there they saw a ray of hope. Perhaps, not all is lost. These people may have the right passion, but unfortunately none of them are artists. Perhaps that's the reason why they couldn't understand their art. However, upon seeing the night lotus again, they realized there's one more person whom they had forgotten. It's obvious, since his creation can connect so. Many people, including themselves perhaps he can help them. That's when the two Miss Singnans chose to leave after over a week's unscheduled stay. It was unscheduled because it was never their intention to stay that long. Their original plan was to sneak in before opening hours and leave without being seen. The painting was so ethereal, it was so surreal that it took them off guard. Hence, for this reason the puppeteer suggest for a detour. How about we check out his other work? It's on the way anyway. There's more, said the very surprised Daydara. Yeah, according to my source, Noon knew about it because they kept it away from public knowledge. Why would they do that? In his mind, to hide such amazing piece of art would be a crime. You will see, when you finally meet him. Having said that he already knew what his partner's going to say thus lead on. Let's go. They were so used to one another's strange antics, they didn't need to say anything more on the same topic. All that's left is some minor bickering between them to pass the time. However, unknown to the two, they didn't know what awaits them ahead. Obviously, Sasori's expecting a few left behind pieces. After all, his source did say there's one that's crafted on the wall. If that's true, there it would be very difficult to remove. Hence, he wouldn't be expecting something like Kanahagakur and the Gallery of Miracle Paintings. When they get there, sneaking in was easy. While they bickers every now and then, the two can be stealthy when they want to. Since they are only here for the art, there's no need to spill blood and make mess of things. Besides, aside from a few security guards the place is almost empty. With their skills, they could literally stroll through without anyone seeing them. This is perhaps the mistake from both the Fire Lord and Ojima as none of them expect anyone making the connection so soon. Since the conversion from prison to museum hadn't been started, full security measure isn't in place yet. As a matter of fact, the Fire Lord is in the meantime securing funds for a new security contact. He did this by slowly introducing close and trusted friends to Naruto. While our hero gets paid, the Fire Daimyo too gets a small cut to fund the museum project. It's a deal they both agree on to not draw attention to the elemental nation. While this is happening, Sasori and Daidara in the meantime were marveling the huge gallery in front of them. Holy F asterisk asterisk asterisk. 
are they all his work? Unfortunately, his partner couldn't answer him because he too is just as surprised. Slowly the two stroll forth and to look at the closest painting. There they immediately knew as they recognize his UZU signature. It was the same as the Night Lotus, therefore without a doubt they knew it's the same artist's work. Besides they didn't need to see the signature to know because the painting eludes the same familiar feeling they felt from the Night Lotus. So without anyone. Knowing, the two intruders bend into the background as they slowly soak in the incredible sights of the painting. Kurosaki, fire treasurer, too is there but he was too busy taking notes to care. Similarly there are also many security guards that too missed the two intruders. Despite their loud nature, the two Akatsuki member can be stealthy when they want to. Since their goal is just to enjoy the gallery, they opt to not make a scene. Aside from the head of security, every staff member is just a civilian. Then again, the civilian-based prison didn't need a Kage-level head of security thus he's probably high Chunin or low Jonin. Therefore, even Unionon he wouldn't be a match against two Missingnans like Sasori and Daidara. Luckily and thankfully, the two found the art too precious to start a fight because even they can't guarantee to not damage anything should a fight got started. It's less of a hassle to be a ghost and enjoy themselves. At first, the two thought after seeing this many artwork they would forget about the Night Lotus. However, they were wrong because deep in their hearts, the Night Lotus is housed inside a palace of their minds. They knew even if they want to, it would be quite impossible to forget about it. Is this the true level of art? Something that cannot be erased? Deep in their minds, they knew this artist is someone they can admire and possibly have the answer they had been seeking all these years. It had been a long time since they were this passionate about something. Despite hurrying along, it still took them half a day to get through the gallery. They would have stayed longer but they knew they can't. Eventually they came to the final piece Kanahagakur, and the two self-claimed artists were stunned. Compared to their own art, it's like comparing heaven and earth. Although they are very much different but the level between them is simply too vast to describe. It made the two of them to feel ashamed calling themselves artists. Having seen what they came here for, the two had a lot to think about. Their feeling were similar, Kanahagakur had demolished their understanding in what art supposed to be. As oddly as it may sound, it's like trying to reach to the height of heaven only to find there's a whole universe beyond. However, Despite seeing something that could crush any dreamers the two didn't give up their own ideals. Instead, having seen what heaven and beyond was like they are now even more enthusiastic. Knowing they will be seeing the creator himself, the two are very much looking forward to understanding what it means to reach the level of heaven and beyond. Fire Capital Once the two arrive in the capital, the two were surprised how effortless it is to find their target. All they need to do is to listen to the gossip and they immediately recognize it's the same person they were looking for. As it turns out, their target is actually very well known and well talked about among the local community. That's because unlike his home village, he's not ostracized. It was because of that, he mingled well with the locals. However, that isn't the only reason that got him famous, nor is it his occupation. As a matter of fact, people are still speculating what he do for a living. Anyway, most people in the city thinks he's secretly part of the royal family. While the fire capital isn't small, gossip is everywhere thus easily spread to every corner of the city. This is especially true for someone that happens to be somewhat connect to the royal family but actually living outside the palace walls. People can't make out what he is. Is he a royalty? If he is, shouldn't he be living behind the castle walls? If he isn't, how can he come and go into the palace like it's his backyard? Then there's also his relationship with the palace guards. Not only does it seem like he knew every one of them, their patrol route somehow extend to protect also his home. His arrival also isn't a mystery as the community found out he's personally escorted by the fire lord into the palace. On top of that, 
it's also widely known that his new home is a personal gift from the Fire Lord. Hence, overall he's a mystery to the locals. Some went as far as speculating he's some illegitimate child of the royal family. Then again, despite all that, it wasn't why he's famous. Funny thing is, this happened on his first day living in the capital. Since it's a new city, it came as no surprise he would someone get himself familiar with the place. He hadn't much need for himself as his meal was secure with Chef Yukihara, see last chapter. Hence, his first destination would be the market. It was one of the places people gather and Naruto likes crowds, thus it's only natural that's where he would go. He probably needs some painting equipment anyway, so he hoped to secure a supply line for his hobby. However, on his way he found himself witnessing an incident. It's a orphan trying to steal but got himself caught red-handed by the baker. Gotta, you little scoundrel. Let go, you are hurting me. They always say the same thing and the moment the owner saw dirty he is, he knew immediately whom he's dealing with. While orphans are to be pitted but lately they had been a plagued for the capital. The baker isn't a bad person but he could let people just steal from him. Then again, stealing is wrong and he want the small child to understand that. At the same time, that's also the moment our hero appear. Hey! His involvement surprised both the baker and the little children. As mentioned, the owners isn't a bad guy. Thus upon seeing him, he knew Naruto isn't another one of orphans. Despite not knowing whom he is, he acknowledged him anyway. Just go away kid, this got nothing to do with you. This one stole from me, I won't do anything to him but I am taking him to the authorities. Upon hearing this, the kid panicked because he didn't want to be locked up. Please let me go, I won't do it. Again. I am only doing it for my kid sister, I just want to do something nice for her on her birthday. True enough, there's a younger girl hiding some distance away. At least the baker is less strict but he still didn't let go of his hand. Had the kid asked and gave him a reason, he would have given it away for free. However, the kid chose instead to take what is not his. As the baker continues to frown, Naruto spoke again. How about this, I will pay for the bun. This way it won't be stealing, right? Kid, you are generous. Young man like you is a good example to today's youth. However, had the kid asked nicely I wouldn't had minded giving it to his sister. His heart is perhaps in the right place but the way he went about doing it is wrong. Unfortunately, every choice we make has consequences, I want him to understand that. Like I said, I won't do anything to him. I will leave the authorities to handle it. That's when another party too joining the scene as our hero wave him over. Hey, Hibikizen. Can you help us out here? Hearing his name, the guard came over and greeted him politely. Naruto Dono. Obviously, his attitude surprised the baker because unless you are someone very important, the palace doesn't treat you with such respect. Just whom the hell is this kid? Meanwhile, Naruto explains what he knew and the baker's stance. So, what do you think, Hibikizen? Do you think you can give this kid a break just this once? Is this true? He turns to the owner and kid, acting as professionally as he can. Ah, uh, guard San. Yes, it is true. I caught the kid red handed and was about to send him your way when Naruto, Dano, San showed up. He just realize he didn't know how to address this new kid so he tries to use the same reference the guard used. Anyway, from what we heard the kid's only stealing because it's his kid sister's birthday. Guard San, I have nothing against this kid but I think stealing is wrong so I was hoping to see there are still some justice in place for this kind of thing. Having said that, all eyes are now on Hibiki. Eh, er, right. Despite what he says, he's clearly been backed into a corner. That's probably right because Hibiki isn't someone that like to take responsibility, he's a bit like Shikamaru Nara in that regard. On one hand, the baker was right so he need to think of some kind of punishment. Something not too harsh but fitting to the crime. 
Unfortunately, the kid's puppy-looking eyes isn't making it easy on him. Then came the wrecking ball in form of a little bundle. At first the little one was too scared to come out but seeing her brother might be taken away from her, she had to come out. It's quite heartbreaking, even the baker's feeling guilty for dragging the issue this far. He wasn't wrong, because the capital is having a lot of problems with the orphanage children and they are slowly affecting everyone. Thankfully, the incident is only happening in a side street and it's still fairly early. Wah, Bli is no takey sura away. He's Rainey's brewer. I don't know how to write slurs, a little girl rush over and is clearly very young. The way she slurs in her speech show she's still learning how to talk. It's also probably why she's hiding in the shadows so other kids can't make fun of her. Are both of you from the orphanage? Naruto may not know whom they are but he could easily recognize signs of someone from the same background as himself. This time it's Hibiki that answered. Yes, Naruto don't know. I know them and they are both from the nearby orphanage, it's unfortunate, the capital's biggest problem is mostly came from these young children. Somehow, Naruto can understand them because he was like that back in Kanoha. Where other children have their own families they forget what it means to have what others don't. Hurtful words carelessly spoken without care, even what they think are harmless taunts are sometimes deadly stabs to the heart. Leave them, ignore them, they are only like that because they have noon to teach them. They smell like trash because they are trash. Don't go near them. You don't want to turn out like them, do you? Our hero don't need to ask to know how they feel or how their lives are like. I tell you what. Since it's your kid sister's birthday, let's have a party. Old man, I said I would pay so let's make a deal. I will pay for everything you have in your bakery. My only condition is you let bygone be bygone. This way, it's a win-win for all of us. What do you think? To be honest, the baker didn't know what to think because this is just too good to be true. However, is this right? He isn't one to look in a gift horse's mouth but at the same time he's still conflicted. I think it's a great deal, I'd take it if I were you. That was the last push he needed, a nudge from a palace guard. Sighing to himself, he accepts the deal and said. You know, it was never my intention to separate the two sibling. I know, old man. The baker couldn't help but give him another look. His word sounded sincere, he had a strange feeling this won't the last they will see each other. Today is definitely a strange day, he's also willing to forget the whole thing if the kid is kidding him. The reason is because no matter how much your parent has, he doubt they will allow him spending it this way. Hence, he had to be sure. Er, my young sir, he didn't know how to properly address him. Call me Naruto. Yes? Naruto Dono. I have no reason to doubt you but I am assuming you want to cater for the whole orphanage? Right. The main reason I am asking is because I may need time to prepare for the right order. What he's trying to say is to indirectly tell him is how much it will be. By now he knew this Naruto kid is somewhat new to the capital. The orphanage isn't exactly small, hence it will probably need substantial amount of Rio for such event. Seeing. He's only eleven year old, the baker wonder if he can afford it. Similarly, Hibiki had similar thoughts. Naruto is maybe a guest of their lord but does he have that kind of money? In a sense, they'd be catering for at least over a one hundred people, including the staff. By my estimate, the total deal would be 2,500 Rio, around 25 Rio per head. Is that acceptable? Everyone though he would change his mind, then to their surprise, he say. Is that's all? Hey, what's your name? Me? Seeing Naruto nod, he responded, Sora. He's still shocked by the older teen's action so he's going autopilot but he did not forget to introduce his sister. That's Rina. Excellent, since it's your party. What else would you like to eat? By now even the palace guard is shocked. 2500 Rio is no small amount, 
but since he's the daimyo's special guest he must also come from a rich family background. It wasn't only that, Naruto even personally went shopping in secret which he later had delivered to the orphanage. Some latest trend in toys, games and popular stuff that's happening in Fire Capital. It was quite a shock through the party as everyone was present, even Hibiki. They watch him mix in with the children, play with them, asking them how to play some of these games. He may had brought them but he himself had never experienced any of them. As a matter of fact, it was the orphans that's teaching him all the latest trend. For some strange reason, despite knowing this Naruto, is the sponsor they sense a familiar soul like them through him. Some can sense through his sad eyes, he's no different to any of them. Hence, without another word they mingle with him. On the other hand, this surprises the local caretakers and staff member because they knew these kids very well. They will find out the next day that some of the children confess thinking Naruto was somehow an orphan like them. Although, they couldn't explain it but it became one of the local community's mysteries involve their new neighbor. Since then, Naruto went to visit every now and then. He even arranged a constant supply of freshly taste buns from the shop owner to the orphanage. Since the little girl liked cinnamon buns so much, Naruto made it so the orphanage gets their supplies. Yes, it's Hinata's favorite, I know. No reason why someone's else not liking it. With him around, he sometimes even joined them for breakfast, lunch or even dinner. This means that he too had made arrangements for meals and all paid through his pocket. Of course, this incident caught the ears of the locals. However, it wasn't the act of kindness that earned him his fame. It was in one day he had changed the children in the orphanage whereas noon can. The community can feel it because these children are no longer causing trouble. Even the fire lord was impressed. Maybe I should have listened to Dojima, that kid truly lives up to his name Maelstrom. Ha 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 ha. In the end, he couldn't help but laugh at his own. Joke. Those that knew him too couldn't help but find a funny side in this. Chef Yukihara was a fine example because he's expecting him to make waves but having heard the full story even he was flabbergasted. Damn, that kid's unpredictable. He didn't just make waves, he's making a tsunami as he became the talk of the city. For people he didn't know, he went the extra mile and more for them. Hiko's artware thanks to that one incident, the newest member of the fire capital became gossip and spread like wildfire. Considering several parties being involved, shop owners, orphanage caretakers, shops Naruto visited, and recounting the events, people starts to wonder who this person is. Then there's also his rumored attitude. His direct and bash attitude is both offensive and hilarious depending who you are. Hey, old man. Who you calling an old man, I am only 39. Hiko. Compare to him you, are, old another voice added in close approximation to the other. Hiko deflated, feeling a little exhausted by the exchange. Not you too danky. Anyway, what do you want boy, the last he said to the newcomer. See, even you have to admit. Calling me boy only made you older, his response only made danky laugh louder. Damn it, kid. Just tell me what you want, so I can get rid of you. Oh, I am just checking if my orders arrive. No, they are not. Now, go away. Come on, old man. No need to deny it, we both know you love me. By then, the said boy had to run as Hiko threw a brush his way. It was probably a good idea as Hikosen was ex-shinobi as the pointy ends of the brush stabbed at the wood frame of the exit. You know Hiko, why can't you admit you like that kid? You want a brush too? Hiko had already produced two brushes between his fingers. His friend had to sweat drop, Hiko can be unreasonable sometimes. No, no, no. Just chill man. After a while, he admitted. That kid's rude and bash, if he isn't one that's keeping my store afloat, would have kicked him out long ago. His friend knew he's not fooling anyone. Before the kid's arrival, he was never seen this lively. 
Of course, there's another story in there. Apparently, this all happened not too long after the orphanage incident. While his deed became the talk of the capital, very few knew what he looked like. Since they don't even know his name, they sometimes refer him as the Mystery Prince or just Prince for short. As for Naruto, once he's happy with the orphanage situation, he went back to his original plan and that's searching for supplies. He could have arranged everything to be delivered but our hero likes to meet people. So he decides to check out the stores himself and that's how he met Hiko. Sadly, based on their interactions, previous conversations, their initial meeting obviously didn't go so well. That's because Hiko had a strange habit of selling to only professionals. He didn't want brats to misuse his expensive wares for stupid vandalism. There are a lot of rich kids in fire capital, hence when he saw Naruto he thought he's one of them. Go away brat, I don't do business with wannabes. Wannabes, it's the first time he heard such word. I bet you want to impress some girls. Too bad, I don't sell to punks like you. Hey, old man I am not a punk. I will have you know that I start painting since I was seven. He didn't know what a punk is, but he obviously knew it's some kind of insult. Hiko only gave him another glance but didn't change his attitude towards him. You are still a brat in my eyes. Go away, then he added. Art is for professionals, I will not sell you my stuff for doodles. That's it old man, you give me a brush and I will show you they are not doodles. Like hell, do you know how expensive they are? I am not giving you anything. A pencil and a sketch pad then, I will even pay for them. Having said that he threw a few rios down to show he's serious. All right, kid. Knock yourself out. I will make you eat those words. Hiko ignore him, he didn't think he could produce anything. Kids talk big these days. In the end, quality art isn't something you can just produce out of thin air. Especially not with a pencil and a sketch pad. Talk is cheap, show me what you got. He's dead set on the punk not producing anything significant and his standard is very high. Obviously and long story short, Hiko lost. Even with just a pencil, his sketch was stunning and so detailed that left Hiko speechless. Like Kirito, Hiko too heard about prodigies but from what he can see this brat is beyond that. At first he just want to teach him about arrogance but somehow the kid has what it take to be that arrogant. Well, from a professional point of view that isn't really arrogance but confidence. Then again whom can guess a pre-teen could be such a professional? Nevertheless, no matter how long he stared at the finished sketch, Hiko couldn't find a single flaw. Even professionals have flaws, just what the hell is this kid? Despite his ill intentions, he isn't vain enough to falsify something that isn't true. That's how he accept him as a customer. Unfortunately, their initial clash caused a small rift between them. Despite their differences, deep down they both admire one another. Naruto for his obvious talent, whereas Hikosen for his exceptional services and ability to acquire the latest and best materials. Whatever he needs he will get as Hikosen can commission anything. Even if he couldn't, he can always hire ninjas to get what he needs. In addition, Hiko is also a fine craftsman as most of the wares and custom modifications are made with his own hands. It was one of the reasons our heroes interested in this shop. On the other hand, to Hikosen someone like Naruto is also a godsend because with him in the art community, this business will no longer be a dying art. However, little did he know at the time this blonde brat is also the one responsible for the storm that's brewing in Suna. As someone in the art business, it's obvious he's heard of the Desert Lotus. However, no matter how extraordinary the sketch is, it would be hard for anyone to connect it to the famous painting. Even with his UZU signature, even Hiko wouldn't believe this kid is the very same artist everyone in the elemental nation is searching for. The sketch is of the shop interior, although black and white it's like a photograph. However, what distinct it from an actual photo is its artistic look. Aside from the art, 
the details were spot on as Hiko could almost count the number of wares through this one sketch. It's another reason why he concede his own defeat. Damn brat, you win. What do you need? And so, Naruto gave him his order and check out his wares. Since then, Naruto would come by every so often. After seeing where Hiko plays his sketch, it's obvious he met his approval. In the end, their interaction turned into this strange love and hate relationship. Hiko because of his own pride wouldn't admit he enjoyed the kid's company whereas Naruto enjoyed the verbal exchange. Others may think they are odd, but to those that knew them they can see how they enjoy talking to one another. It's again another mystery with their new resident that left people scratching their heads. Do they like each other or just want to kill each other? Even to this day, many are still puzzled by that mystery. Royal guards and priests as months flow by, our hero is too adjusted himself to the normal life of the capital. Like he did with Ichiraku back in Kanoha, he goes to Yukihara, palace cook, nearly every day for ramen. From time to time he would visit the orphanage to see how they are doing and sometimes even join them for meals. A lot has been changed since his involvement and the place is more lively. He's also their biggest contributor so the staff had no reason to stop him and the children got along well with him. As a matter of fact, with him around the children were a lot less mischievous. According to those in earshot, that was because they were in the presence of the king of mischief. Then again, with Naruto paying for everything everyone's too busy having fun. There's even changes on the fire court as the fire lord appointed a new official to oversee internal affairs. This was obviously created for our blonde hero's purpose. Daimiya-sama. Naruto, my boy. Hey, I hear about the orphanage. Very few can do what you did for these poor kids. Eh, thanks. Actually, I am here about the orphanage. Now he is curious, because the orphanage kids had been a major source of headache for him in recent years. Report after report, complain after complain but noon with a solution. Hence, when Naruto mentioned the orphanage it caught his interest. Just ask away, anything within my power I will grant you. What do you need? With Naruto they have a very strange kind of relationship as the Fire Lord felt he owned him. This was mostly because of the Kanahagakur wall. Painting. In a sense, no matter what he give him it will never be enough. Hence, he's very obliged to help him. You remember saying that the royal accountant will handle all my transactions? It's true, through their last discussion they are still establishing all the paperwork. Unfortunately, all the assets needs to be fully documented before payment can start. With the mountain of paintings and the priceless wall painting, they are easier said than done. Nevertheless, the royal accountant will handle the business between them fair and square. When it comes to a talented individual like Naruto, it's better to have someone trustworthy to handle the money exchange. There's noon more trustworthy than the fire court. I want half of it to go to the orphanage. Do you think you can arrange that? Funny enough, the expression on the Fire Lord isn't surprise but actually horror and Naruto in turn is taken aback by what he saw. What did I say? What did I do? It's clear he didn't quite fully understand what's going on. This could be the result of his upbringing in Kanoha. Through mistreatment, overcharge and refused service he may have developed a mindset that everything will be very expensive. Combined with the lack of management skills, he would simply flash his money and let others sort it out for him. Hence, the fire daimyo did make the right call to appoint him a financial advisor or an accountant to help managing his money. While donating a huge sum of money to the orphanage is a good deed from his part. How he did it is the Fire Lord's biggest concern because with this much money you can't simply hand it over and expect things to be done right. Then there's the crazy amount he's knowing or unknowingly handing over. He assume he didn't know how much they are talking about, which he isn't wrong because Naruto had no idea how much he has. Recovering from the initial shock. Naruto. That is very generous of you. He blushed by the praise. 
but I think you may have underestimated the value of your assets by little too much. That's probably a huge understatement but he wouldn't know. I know how much you want to help these children but sadly just handing money over wouldn't be enough. I tell you what, let me find someone to oversee the orphanage. Only then will we talk about donating your money. How does that sound? Narutakun, another thing. I know you are new to this but there's no need for you to give half of your wealth, just a small fraction will do. I understand you mean well, but to just simply giving away money would only do more harm than good. Why? Because not everyone have the same intention as you do. Hence why we need someone trustworthy to do that job. On top of that, 1% would be more than enough to keep the orphanage running for a very long time. Like I said, let's talk after I find an official then we can discuss this in detail. It may sound like a long roundabout way but thankfully he understood why it's necessary. No matter how much money you have, unless you know how to manage them you could become poor quickly. Although, he can always paint more paintings but it wouldn't solve anything. Again the daimyo did make the right call or the capital would be in chaos. Chaos from one naive kid whom doesn't understand the value of money. If he start paying everything randomly with a million rio, the infrastructure of the capital economy would collapse. True to his words, a new officials appointed and Naruto settle things with the royal accountant. As per the fire lord and the accountant's suggestion, 1% of his earnings will go to the orphanage, 1% of a million is 10,000 considering a million is the baseline for each of his paintings. What they say is true, considering each his painting sell around 1 million rio, 10,000 rio would go toward the orphanage. It's more than enough to pay for everything for a long time. Once that deal is taken care of, he's back to his old daily routine and the palace guards all got to know him personally. That's his personality, wherever he goes he can easily attract people to his side. It wasn't just the civilians that are curious, even the guards all wonder about his relationship with their daimyo. Usually, it's people that are trying to see the daimyo but with him it's the other way round. Today is another day that the fire lord took time off from his busy schedule just to visit the teen. Man, I told the kid to live inside the palace and what does he do, he live outside. Despite his complain, he's very enthusiastic as he make his way to his home. He said he would finish by the end of the week. Of course, all the guards can do is salute. They may be curious, but like always it's not their business to question their lord's every action. The most mysterious of all is why the teen is given the open-door policy treatment to the palace. It was never heard of and now the fire lord himself is coming and going to the teen's place? All they can do is watch, but it wasn't just the fire lord but also members of the fire court. If that's not enough of a surprise, it's later followed by more members of the royal family. Just who the hell is this kid? It was for this reason that the royal guards all treat him with respect. Then again, unlike the royalties Naruto is very humbled and easy to get along. He has somehow a natural charm to attract people to him, so the guards love him. Call it God's doing or he's just that lucky. On one occasion, the knucklehead blonde decides to explore the guards' quarters. It's not like it's sealed off or something, it's just that no royalty would ever go in there. At least not until Naruto, they still think he's some kind of noble, and that's how he caught them in the middle of a card game. Hey, isn't that poker you are playing? Naruto? Seeing it's the kid, they unconsciously breath a sigh of relief. You scared the Jesus out of us. We thought you. Were the captain. Naughty Rowan-san, I guess I caught you guys red-handed. Trying not to be seen too guilty, they try to make it seem causal. Don't be silly, this is the guard quarters we can do what we want. Wanna join? Maybe you get lucky and win a few rios from us. Lucky? My brothers used to tell me, I have Lady Luck as guardian angel. Of course, at the time they didn't believe him. However, when he starts to win every hand they knew otherwise but it was already too late. 
The most disbelief of all is Hibiki as he bet all his money on the pot. Apparently, he showed up in the middle of a game. With a three aces full house, he thought he's getting lucky so he push all his chips into the pot. Alan, he cries excitedly. The others tries to stop him but fell to deaf ears. Hey, Hibiki. You should take it easy. The kid here is Lady Luck Incarnate. Yeah, before you were here. He won every hand. No way, I know what I am doing. This game is mine. Come on kid, show me what you got. Once Naruto accepts the bet and put equal stake into the pot, they both show their hand cards. As expected, Hibiki show he has a full house with three aces and two sevens. Unfortunately as expected, the blonde teen has a better hand with four queens and a king. Four of a kind. Later, Naruto found out the fool Hibiki had bet all his wedding expenses. He wanted to return the money but as much as Hibiki wished to accept it, he hesitated. Royalty or not, the kid is still a kid. Can he really accept his money? Just when he couldn't decide what to do, Naruto stuffed it in his hands. Just take it Hibikazen, let's just say this is from everyone. Everyone can see he's trying to play it off as a gift from everyone and to give Hibiki some face. The others like it too, thus it would become tradition to lose money in future games on special occasions. So in a sense, it's like Hibiki winning the poker game only it's Naruto that won it for him. Naruto didn't stop there. Hey, Hibikazen. You still looking for a priest and a place for the wedding, right? If it's one of those western weddings, I know a priest that owns me a favor, how about I get him to host it? Aside from the money, the other thing that concerns Hibiki was finding a priest and place to host the wedding. Normally he wouldn't bother the kid because he already owned him for the money. However, after hearing it's the priest owning him a favor he thought he could accept it. Sure, Naruto. As long as you promise me you won't be pay a penny. You have already done so much for me, I won't live it down if I take any more from you. Naruto may not understand why but what he said was true. The priest did say he will do anything for him. Sure thing Hibikazen. The priest did say I can ask for anything. You know me, what do you think I do with the offer, it isn't like I will be marrying any time soon. The kid's right, even if he's to marry it would be at least years from now. Besides he really do need a priest. He's also in a tight spot too as all the places he's been to were fully booked. Hence, if his future wife truly want a western wedding they may have to do it outside the capital. So when the kid says the priest owning him a favor, this could be an opportunity. However, what he didn't know is the priest isn't just anyone but the head priest of fire country himself. He's also the priest that host royal weddings, that in turn mean the location of the wedding would be in the royal chapel. Hibiki had truly underestimated the blonde teen's connections. Or rather he should had known because of all the royalties coming and going to his home. Nevertheless, he and his lucky lady will be in a world of shock when it comes to that day. Commitment would be the least of his problem because stepping on the altar would be like trying to sit on a king's throne with every dignitary watching your every move. As for his lucky lady, it would most likely be a different story. Thanks to Naruto's part in the church's restoration the complete chapel is transformed. As rumor has it, a royal wedding there is like a step onto the heavens as you recite your vows to gods. Note, in Naruto lore, wedding tradition can come in two popular forms. Traditional Japanese wedding, like Naruto and Hinata in anime, or western. Hence, in this chapter one will go for a western for easier understanding. As mentioned, Naruto was somehow responsible for restoring the church's paintings. Apparently, he was introduced by the fire daimyo for the part. However, at the time the head priest didn't take him seriously and pass him over to his junior. Usually, that's a sign of disrespect to both the artist and the fire lord. Then there's also the week of inaction on Naruto's side, that further solidify the head priest's initial impression on the young artist. 
At first he thought the kid is just someone having high standing with royalties thus had very little skill. Having heard how he had spent over a week chatting with the staff and done no work, he thought the kid was here for the free paycheck. What the priest didn't know was that in order to fully and accurately restore them, Naruto must first understand what they meant and why they are so special. Hence, aside from talking to everyone, he did a little research to find out each was created. He even learned a little about the original painter, his lifestyle and background. In the end, his work paid off as the results were shown through the restoration. However, many would agree they are much better than the original. It had almost caused a riot as the young priests urgently calls their patriarch. Many thinks he's some kind of messiah or even an angel in disguise because no human can produce what they are seeing. As he restore each painting, the chapel would transform. Like the legends they call, Seventh Heaven, they are ascending with each completed restoration. It was surreal hence the panic and the young priests didn't know what to think. It was for this reason that the head priest is now overseeing his work. Sadly, only Naruto is still inconspicuous to the whole situation. He didn't mind but he enjoy hearing more about these paintings as the head priest explain in more detail on what he not know. At the same time, the priest too learned more about his working strategy. So he's a little guilty in his assumptions but what the teen is doing is uncanny and in extreme sense a little creepy. Even through his eyes, he can't understand how he did it. It's like magic but yet it is not hence he can't rule out the possibility that he's not human. Then again he had learned his lesson, so he won't jump to conclusion again. Once all ten portraits are fully restored even the head priest couldn't bring himself to believe what he's seeing. Restored is probably incorrect because he didn't paint over the original. Although it's not what the church asked but he copied and repainted them in his style. As an artist he thought he should sign his work thus his reason. Having seen the otherworldly results, he can do whatever he wants. The other members of the church too wholeheartedly agreed as they could stop gaping at the paintings. If Naruto reveal himself as God, they would probably believe him. Once the paintings are up, like a huge face lift the whole place felt as ethereal as the heaven itself. Instead of being afraid, they felt blessed and an honor to be in the same house. It's a welcoming experience and something completely out of this world. Unfortunately, because of this the head priest's feeling exceptionally guilty. Thus, despite the huge paycheck and bonuses, they offer him their service as thank you. It wasn't just the head priest, even the younger members were very happy to help. They probably thought helping the earth stranded angle slash entity would make God see them in a different light. Hence, our hero can only accept the deal while scratching his head. He isn't a praying type and he's only eleven so marriage isn't top of his list, so he had no idea what to do with it. As if it's the universe responding, our hero got himself tangled with Hibiki. That's when he remember the deal he made with the church and true to their promise they literally drop everything and him their priority. It's no surprise as some priests still think he's some kind of messiah. Thus, whatever he want, they will no doubt manage with at least 120% enthusiasm. Hence, when the acutal wedding came, it wasn't just Hibiki and his sunbuife whom were surprised, their friend and families were equally flabbergasted. This include all the palace guards as they too were equally astonished. They knew the kid is special but to have also influence with the royal church, that's simply beyond their comprehension. Even the royal families don't have that much influence. Seeing the head priest greet him with such veneration gave them mixed feelings. Nevertheless, the wedding went on but it didn't stop their friends and families. Slightly distracted by the interior. Especially from the ten paintings, it's like they were in presence of holy entities. Everyone truly believed they were inside something holy. Their eyes too were almost glued to the altar because that's the biggest highlight of the chapel. Not because of the bride and groom but because that the special place were the couple making their vows. Aside from the bride and groom, even bystanders can feel the love between them. It's what made think this is truly a holy place and why it's so special. 
No matter how many times he witnessed it, it never ceased to amaze him. The royal priest may not believe him an angel or a higher being but he couldn't find himself to disrespect him. He is as the fire daimyo said, a very exceptional and talented individual. Then again, even he had no idea what to think of him. Because with talent to produce miracles like that is unthinkable. Thankfully, unlike the visitors this is his twentieth wedding so he's less surprised thus carry on his duty. As for both bride and groom, the ceremony is a true blessing as they can see into each other's feelings thus making their vows to each other more binding. This too was very awe-inspiring for guests as they too were very happy to stay as witness to such union. It wasn't just the bride and groom as those that came with their partners too were feeling the after-effects as they unconsciously held each other's hands. The only downside for the priest is his odd feeling that he owned the kid even more. Miracles are called miracles because they don't happen. But because of his paintings, the church is performing one miracle after another. It's like a life debt that couldn't be paid back. The priest wonder if it can ever run out. It's something that even the holy man have no idea about and his prayers weren't exactly returned. It wasn't just the head priest, as the palace guards were equally troubled. Even royal families don't have that much influence over the church. However, one word from the kid even the head priest came running to his bidding. With their own very eyes, they had seen how the Pope treated the kid. What the heck is this kid? None of them dared to curse in the church, especially a holy one like this. Mixed feelings or not, it wouldn't matter either way because his kindness will always be remembered. They also don't care whom he is, as from the very beginning they already see him as one of them a family. The Akatsuki anyway and very unfortunate, thanks to that popularity he unknowingly made himself an easy target for the Akatsuki. Because all they need to do was listen to the gossip and they immediately knew where he is and where he lived. Hence, how Sasori and Daidara found him and they appearing on his doorstep. We have been looking for you. It was the first thing here when he opened his door. Who are you, and what do you want? Just like anyone, he asked the same question anyone would have asked. We want something from. You. Not knowing what kind of danger he's in and without knowing whom he's dealing with he opened the door wider. What is it? However, very lucky for him, these two weren't here for his biju. Actually, my partner and I had been arguing for a very long time on a subject on art. We knew you are an exceptional artist, so we hope you can be the tiebreaker. My partner says art should be eternal, but I think he's just biased because he's building puppets. However, I on the other hand think art should be a blast. You know like fireworks. As one artist to another, who do you think is correct or closer to the truth? As odd as the May 2nd seem, it isn't every day he get visitors like them. So like a fool he is, he invited them in. Despite what everyone, Fire Daimyo and Dojima, said to him, Naruto is still a naive child. He thinks people who loved art are all nice people. You can't blame him as the only art lovers he knew so far are Kirito, Sensei, Dojima and the Fire Daimyo. Then again, he's also quite interested in their argument so he want to hear more of their story. Also as a fellow artist he wouldn't mind helping another in need. Once he and his guests were comfortably settled, he starts to think about his answer. Hmm, he thought about both of their logics. It was an interesting concept, it's something he hadn't thought about hence his interest. So after contemplating, he answered. I think you are both right then he proceed to explain. Art isn't definite because it can exist in any form. It's like choosing which flower is the most beautiful, like a rose or a lily. Can you safely say one is more beautiful than the other? You can't because both have their own appeals. The same can be said when it comes to the sun and the moon, can you really favor one and not the other? In my opinion, I think this all comes down to an artist's creativity and imagination. Hence, in an essence picking one over the other would be the same as putting a limit on yourself. What's being said stunned the two Miss Singnans. 
Despite their trouble in coming all the way here, they didn't have high hopes in him solving their dilemma. For years, they had been locked in an eternal struggle with one another only to see how wrong they both are. They weren't exactly wrong, like Naruto had said they were both right and wrong at the same time. Because what they were arguing is basically two sides of the same coin. However, from the way he had said it the two had a nagging feeling that this coin isn't limited to just two sides. Preposterous, right? A coin has only two sides, right? Why are they thinking about coins in the first place? Nobody said anything about coins, perhaps this was about the sun and moon reference. He also mentioned about flowers, as they weren't limited to just roses and lilies. Most importantly of all, what he said made a lot of sense. Deep down and on subconscious level, the two sensed a new kind of doors they had never explored. They were subconsciously acknowledging it, thus meaning they hadn't quite fully understand what it means. In the meantime, their minds are still recovering from his incredible insight. From there, Naruto too learn a little about their art in detail. Why don't the two of you tell me a little about your art? I am very interested in how you came to your ideals. That's when they get to talk, in Sasori's case show off his ninja puppets and his prized secret technique involving real corpses. Unfortunately, Daidara couldn't demonstrate his because they are too loud and destructive. However, thanks to his vibrant description Naruto got the general idea. Explanation Although as a civilian, Naruto should be horrified. However, from the very beginning he was never your everyday civilian. Don't forget, he lived with a bunch of hardcore prisoners. Despite they don't openly show him their gruesome side, Naruto isn't stupid. Plus the fact that he also came from a ninja village, hence death and slaughter is normal. It's like living in a family with a slaughterhouse, even as a child you learn one or two things about it. Anyway and thankfully Sasori isn't showing him the process of making corpse puppets so he can listen to his story with an objective mind. Ninja puppets is a ninja thing, so the technical stuff he wouldn't understand. Hence, Sasori had to clear up a few points and why they are so special. Forgoing the graphical details, they at least able to tell him their side of the story. Story continuation Having learned about the meaning behind their art, Naruto sips his tea calmly before speaking his mind. You know what, I can understand where you two came from. To be honest, I don't think I can help you. They were disappointed but despite his incredible talent they didn't have high hopes in him solving their problems. He is after all just a painter and a civilian. He's neither a puppeteer nor a bomb maker, or a ninja. Hence, his answer did not surprise them. However, he's not finished. The most I can offer is perhaps a few suggestions. While he's no ninja, Sasori and Daidara both respect him as an artist, hence their interest in what he has to say. Dia Darison, if it's okay I would like to start with you, seeing them nod, he continued. While in terms of technique I cannot offer you anything. However, I can give you a little of my personal opinion. It may not seem much but both the Mad Bomber and Puppet Master were counting on his artistic insights. From my point of view, I think your art is a little too one-dimensional. What I mean is you seem to fixate on its size and nothing else. To me this is no different to an artist painting with only one color. While you may have made quite an advancement in that area. Again, this is no different to an artist painting on a bigger canvas. It was never meant to be an insult and the Mad Bomber didn't see it that way neither. However, what he had said made sense. As an artist, he had somehow crippled himself by adding limits to himself. It's just as the young artist had said, he's limited himself to a one-dimension kind of thinking. Now that he knew the answer, what could he do to fix that? He's a ninja that makes bombs, the most his clay can do is to explode. So aside from changing its shape, there isn't much left he can do. So how do he expand that dimension? Since the young artist did bring it up, he now realized how much he had boxed himself into the corner. An artist is all about creativity, the freedom to create and run your imagination. 
Even Sasori can see how struck his partner is, they were both so one-track minded they unconsciously placed a limit on themselves. Bitterly, the mad bomber unknowingly turns to the young artist. Smiling in response, Naruto didn't mind giving a fellow artist a helping hand. Like I said before, I can only offer you a few suggestions. Like any other artist, I too can get lost and struck in bottlenecks. However, when that happen I usually stop what I am doing and find someone to talk to. Talk to? We are Miss Singnans, who can we find to talk about our stuff? Before Daedara can voice his disagreement, Naruto stopped him. Deodarison, please let me finish. This is just my story and I am not suggesting you to start talking to people. Through our conversation, I get the feeling that option is not possible for either of you. He may not entirely understand what a missing mean is, but through their story he can tell the two travel a lot. Despite that, my door is always open for you. Both of you, he added the last part to let them know they are both welcome to come to him. Seeing their grateful acceptance nod, he continued. As I was saying, this is just my story. However, I do have a feeling that this is also something for you. This was something shared with me by one of my brothers. Daedara may not know whether he meant a family member or someone he viewed as brother but having heard it's something that could be useful, he listened anyway. It's more or less about a place he visit every so often. Apparently, he has a friend whom is an astrophysicist. He told it's a title given to those whom study stars. Due to the nature of her job, my brother had to climb the tallest mountain in fire country just to visit. Then one night and by chance when he glance upwards, he was stunned to see the most beautiful vision he ever see in his life. It was only later that his friend gets to tell him the view had always been there this whole time. Obviously, the news is quite a shock to my brother because he came to visit time and time again, he never saw something this amazing. His friend can only chuckle humorously and said what he saw was just a small fraction of what's out there. As she tells him that the night sky is filled with many wonders, from the Milky Way, the galaxy, the cosmos, and beyond. Turning to face. Daedara, our hero address him directly. Deodarison, what I want to say next might help you. According to his friend, most of the scientists believed that the universe began by one event which they all called the Big Bang. Dot. That's where it hit him, why he's telling him this story. The Big Bang? Like igniting a spark, he felt rejuvenated. He may not know much about astrophysics but he can see its potential. This is especially true with the term Big Bang as he felt a deep sense of connection which he hoped one day he could uncover. As it turns out the answer was above him the whole time, all he's missing was for someone to point him the right way. At least in this case give him that connection. The two Miss Singnans may not know which mountain his cellmate was talking about but they are both resourceful enough to know about that phenomenon. In order to see them clearly, they need a place where the atmosphere is very thin. The mountains is obviously an ideal place but it's not just any mountain that can give you such majestic view. Ideally a place away from civilian would be best because you will need a isolated place where the only source of light is above you, stars. That's how the universe is most visible and magnificent. It had always been there but sadly humans are only aware of that when they chose to see it. Surprising, Daedara thought he got all the pointers he needs but the blonde painter wasn't finished. Deodarison, while I can understand what you do is unique. However, I think you had misinterpreted what art is all about. While art is a blast does have a nice ring in it, without an audience it would be meaningless. Anyway, I think you'll have much to think about after hearing my story. He's indeed correct as Daedara did have many new ideas and perspectives to explore, and he couldn't wait to get started. What he suggested had him thinking, killing people with art seemed shallow. He didn't gain a conscience, but it's as Naruto says dead people can't talk so how will people know about his art? Leaving the mad bomber to his thoughts, Naruto move on to the puppet master. As for you Sasaurasan. While I can't say I understand the ninja stuff, I do however can sense the effort you put in your puppets. Although, 
that may seem fine. However, what I cannot sense was your purpose. Purpose, he had to ask himself what he meant, and before he can ask the double to clarify Naruto elaborated. Here is a question, is your focus on solely on living puppets or is it about puppetry? That line of inquiry stumped him. He thought he knew his answers but as it turned out, he's just as lost as his partner. Wasn't it always been puppets? Why was I so fixated on living puppets? Why was I into puppetry in the first place? Most importantly of all, since when did he start thinking it as an art? In Suna, puppetry had always been a shinobi art so since when did he start thinking it as an art? There's nothing artistic about killing each other with puppets so why was it an art? Over time, his mastery shift on to turning humans into puppets and his greatest achievement was his skill to control even the dead's bloodline. It was a huge breakthrough in puppet history, not only could he control it he managed to raise the dead by means of puppetry. Unfortunately, it was also that very moment he became obsessed in human puppets. So much that he even turned himself into one. However, now that he think about it he's not truly eternal. A piece of himself is still flesh and blood, so he can eventually one day die. It was just as the blonde says, he too had driven himself into a corner. He realized it now, everything he had achieved up to now they were never the achievement he want. Sighing to himself, he's no different to Daydara, falling into such one-dimensional trap. From his point of view, aside from war he couldn't think of what he could do with puppets. Even he had to admit, puppetry is a dying art because nobody cares about them anymore. Aside from its original use as children's entertainment, there's no other use in puppetry. The puppet master can't see himself performing for little kitties. Another thing, Sasaurusan. While I think you have the art is eternal, right? You missed the fundamental reason why people are calling art as, art. Art is something you bring to life, not the other way round. He's obviously talking about turning humans into puppets. While bringing puppet to life is an ideal but turning living being into puppets before bring them back alive kinda defeats that purpose. He realized that now, because no matter what he do the living puppet would never be more alive than the original. The essence of art has always been about creating something from nothing. Or like his portraits, which he's doing a very good job making them come alive. When he put it that way, it's clear to him turning living people into puppets is a tough sell. Can it still be called art? Deep down he already knew the answer. But what else could he do, aside from fighting and killing he couldn't see how puppetry can evolve. You know, I think you adults are just overthinking things. His comment made the puppet master turn to him, his inquisitive eyes said it all. Sadly what he said next is a disappointment. Unfortunately, I don't have any experience in puppetry to contribute anything because I had never seen a puppet until now. It's true because people Kanoha didn't want him near their children, therefore he can only watch a puppet show from a distance. However, that does not mean I don't have anything for you, Sasaurusan. As my master once said, when you are lost, don't let frustration get to you. Retrace your steps and think back why you picked up a brush. Of course, for you Sasaurusan you should think back why you start on the path of puppetry. Just start small until you have something you can build on. It may seem like a huge setback but think of. This as an opportunity to rethink what you want to achieve in the art of puppetry. Having said that, Naruto let him think about what he said. Well, I will leave the hard part to you. Since you have generous enough to show me your art, let me show you mine. Having said that, he lead them to his art room or his working studio. The two thought they had seen everything but they were wrong. What was in the old prison were simply just his past. Like ninjas through training, an artist too can improve. Evidently it's true as he show them his most recent projects. Can you still call them painting? What they saw is beyond their comprehension as these portraits were like living entities. Instead of sucking you into the portrait, the contents are literally spilling out. At least that's what they see when they set their eyes on them. It's like leaping through dimensions, 
one portrait illustrating the peace of nature to the next which is the busy streets of the fire capital. In the end, the tour was both enlightening and insightful. As Naruto guided them through his minimum gallery, he also gave them a brief history of his work and its creation. It was both inspirational and a great learning experience as the two learn how he came up with ideas and perhaps future projects. He is young and creative, hence the two enjoy talking and discussing art with him. Like he says, they are always welcome. Changes and Evolution Six to nine months later, unknown to Naruto at the time, he didn't think his start small advice would be very helpful. Most of all, he didn't think Sasori would take it literally. He started small all right, as the market was slowly flooded with small little figures. More specifically, small little ninja figures. Near beginning, it wasn't very noticeable but later it caught ninja village's attention. Why? That's because these little ninja figures were replicates of their own ninja kages. Normally, this wouldn't be such a big deal. However, the amount of detail triggered many red flags. While they are harmless, but how the hell did the craftsman knew what color the Mizukage's parties she wear? There's also her three sizes as her scale model is the exact replicate of her real self. When placed alongside the other four kages, they were no different to their real selves. Hence, this triggered a national-wide investigation in finding their maker. It's worrying because whomever made them has intel over five major villages. If they can obtain such detailed information on their leaders, there's no telling what else he or she has. As a result, there's some minor chaos triggered by hidden villages as they search for the maker. Even the poor sellers were brought in for questioning. Since they are just civilians, there's very little the ninjas can get through him, especially when the exchange being done so anonymously. It wasn't long that these figures attracted the younger generations of nobles thus the ninja figures were put on auction. With these powerful people getting involved, the ninja villages had to back down. They don't even have a case, a ninja's three sizes being known isn't exactly national security. They can still investigate in secret but like the Yuzu painter, this ninja figure maker is careful. The whole thing confuses them because they have no idea why all these civilian product are now surfacing and most strangely of all even ninjas couldn't track them. That's true because it wasn't just Sasori that's flapping his wings and sowing chaos, butterfly effect, in the elemental nation. Daidara too were not far behind with his own contribution. Since their last meeting, the two had split up and went their separate ways. While the puppet masters working on set his sight on ninja figures, Daidara took a more drastic path. He went back to the basics. After their talk, the mad bomber want a breakthrough in his art. So he had to start everything from scratch. That means a lot of research and experimenting on himself. So instead of feeding his hand with just clay, he had an idea to try different mixtures. He even infiltrated universities and special research facilities to get what he want. Thanks to his shinobi training, getting in wasn't hard. Combined with his knowledge from his time in Iwa's Explosion Corps as background, they never even suspected him. Hey, where have I seen you before? Me? That's impossible, I am new here. For obvious reason he didn't use his real name. Even when they recognize him as the missing Neen, they wouldn't think the real deal would be there. Hey, for a moment I thought you were the mad bomber, Daidara. Me? You must be crazy. What would Daidara do here? Yeah, you are right. Why would he come here? The fact is wherever he goes, he could bend in. With his advanced knowledge over explosives, few doubted he's not an expert he say he is. Hence, along with the new line of research he's doing, he uncover new kind of element compounds for his needs or future projects. And with his hand, he can remodel them any way he want while putting his theories to the test. Instead of shackling himself to the limitation of blast size. He's now free to explore limitless of possibilities. In the end, it was worth it as he creates something that baffles the whole elemental nation. 
At first, his creation weren't visible on anyone's radar because they are just fireworks. However, when someone finally took notice its wonder spread quickly like wildfire. With just one stick, it light up the whole night sky and it wasn't by means of a single explosion. Instead it was like multiple sets going off. It was no different to fireworks you see in large festivals but all achieved by just one firecracker. Among the amazed there were also those trying to unlock its secrets. Since it's by Kinjutsu, his mouth hand, even ninjas couldn't make heads or tails of it. Is it some kind of weapon? Since they had no idea how it was made, so all they could do was speculate. There are also those like Danzo that can think of many applications with such secret. With the right kind of explosives, one such creation could sow chaos or even destroy a ninja village. Hence, there's a certain level of unrest among ninja villages. Unfortunately, since they can't find its maker there's not much they can do about it. To say the maker is a civilian would be wrong because there isn't M equipment sophisticated enough for such a thing. It's like a new entity entirely, something that was born from something. A little disturbing but that's what their analysts believe. But to say it's done by ninjas would again be unrealistic because why would a ninja make firework? So what about IWA? Wouldn't they recognize their own kinjutsu, mouth hand? Well, very little were known about it and no one in their right mind would think of using it for making fireworks. Hence, as far as they are concerned, stuffing it with clay and producing deadly explosives was its purpose. It would be absurd to think someone using it any other way, especially on someone as inconsequential as firework. As a result the only connection they found is Big Bang printed on them. Is it a company name? Name of a brand? Or is it some kind of premonition? Sadly nobody knows, so all they can do is wait. Hashtag hashtag note, Sasori and Daydara timeline release information Sasori released his first ninja figures around six months after his meeting with Naruto. Whereas Daydara took much longer, around nine months because he doing a little research and experimenting on himself before releasing his new fireworks. Normally I wouldn't care about such timing but some readers seems to want it, so I added a little clarification. Hashtag hashtag back to the story in the meantime, more new ninja figures appear across the elemental nation. Like the Kages, the new figures are mostly on well-known ninjas. While the ninja villages are still curious on their maker, they decided they were harmless thus let them be. Besides, most of their ninjas were already known so it's no different whether you see them in bingo books or in stores. Even the council were very surprised on how popular they are, so they might as well take advantage of it. It's like free advertisement. Who knows, maybe some of them can get popular thus gaining them more clients. The information were no different to their profiles in bingo books, so the ninja villages can live with that. However, what they couldn't anticipate next is the appearance of seven swordsmen of mist figures. Even Kisame was surprised when he saw himself in a mini-action figure. Funny thing is, he only discovered this when he saw a stunned-looking kid looking at him. The fishman-like swordsmen only understand why when the kid was comparing him to his action figure. What the foo asterisk asterisk. His surprise drew everyone's attention on him and that's when everyone knew whom he is. Both he and his partner Itachi had to quickly hightail out of the town. Later they figure out. What's going on as they discover the seven swordsmen action figures. Since then, Kisame had to to be in full cloak whenever he's in town. His eyes couldn't help twitching whenever he sees those figures. I bet my Zabuza can beat your weird fishman Kisame. No way, my Kisame is bigger than your weak-ass Zabuza. No, my Raiga is better. He has two swords and they do lightning. Since when was the seven swordsmen got turned into a foo asterisk 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 franchise? Then again, these are just little brats and civilians so he couldn't do anything. Little did he know, Sasori was internally snickering whenever they came to their meeting, Akatsuki. However, 
Daydara was not so kind as he took every opportunity to outright laugh in his face. That's it, when I find who make them. I will wriggle his neck. How do you know it's a he? Sasori asked innocently. There was a small silence, suggesting the swordsman had no idea. That only got the XIWA ninja to laugh even louder. Obviously, the two artists never had this much fun at their co-workers' expense. Nevertheless, the two were serious when it comes to art. They may joke around but the two never did once reveal they were the true culprits of this whole fiasco. Funny enough, Noon suspected the two likely duo, Sasori and Daidara. Like how civilians can't understand ninjas, ninjas too can't understand the more, down-to-earth, civilians' line of work. This is especially true for, true artists. If they couldn't understand them before, it would come as no surprise they still won't understand them now. Since they are all ninjas and at the very top of their own game, it would be incomprehensible for any of them to go back to something so, civilian. This is no different to Itachi work behind a cash register or Kisame as swimming instructor for housewives. Hence, despite their quirks, the Akatsuki members can't see Sasori or Daidara involving themselves on little ninja dolls and firecrackers, fireworks. However, what they don't know is both Sasori and Daidara are still refining their art. That means, what the Elemental Nation are seeing now is just the beginning. Bonus Elemental Nation, Haku, will you put that damn thing away? Yes, Zabuzasama. The X7 swordsman had to sigh as he had no idea where his apprentice get that damn doll. At first he didn't think much of it but when he saw what it was he was beyond shocked. What is this? Is this some kind of new bingo book? When asked, Haku finally admitted he brought it in the last town. For a very long moment, his expression was unreadable. Like Kisame, the ex-mist swordsman's eyes couldn't help but twitch when he saw himself among his fellow swordsmen. As if adding insult to an injury, his tool somehow adores them. When I get my hands on whoever's making them I will kill them. He assumed there's a production factory somewhere. Unfortunately, he couldn't find the source and the markets flooded with them. Thankfully, he and his old Swordsman buddies weren't the only victims as he recognized Kakashi and Might Guy figures. Oddly enough, there's even a popularity chart. Apparently they were based on their sales number and so far the female ninjas were on the lead. A few on top of that list are Kanoha's Genjutsu Mistress Kurinai, Snake Mistress Anko and the fifth Hokage Tsunade. While the real Kurinai's a little embarrassed, her friend Anko is another story. It's still a touchy subject as it affected even her line of work. In all her interrogations her victims would wonder if it was a trick to throw them off as she questioned whom is the maker of those dolls. It was like she was offended, as she's probably want to find the maker to get her share for her own model. More money just means more dangos for her, hence she wouldn't mind for a little extra cash. On the other hand, Tsunade too was mad for entirely another reasons as she had a feeling her perverted teammate somehow has won. He's lucky he's out in the nation still looking for his godson, otherwise she will be demand him her own doll. Tsunade knew her perverted teammate well because she was not wrong. However, what she didn't know is he being a collector a collector of female figures. Whomever made these is a genius. Thankfully his teammate isn't there to hear him say that or she would punch him all the way to IWA. It isn't just Kanoha Kunoichis that are victims on this production list. Kyumo's Samui 2 is also quite high on the chart. However, it was Mabui that surprised them. Since she's the rakage's assistant, she rarely go on missions. Hence, everyone's very surprised at how they managed to get her data. It's the reason why she's in hiding and covering herself up as she tries to figure out who was the pervert. As for Samui, all she said was, that's, not, cool. Only Karui's having mixed feelings because she's the only one not on the market. Unknown to her, she too was there. But since she wasn't very popular, her figure had a limited number. Unless you are a diehard collector, few have seen her figure. 
The other reason she's not mad is because she's too busy shivering with goosebumps. For some strange reason, she knew there's some pervert out there with her doll. Silently she vowed to castrate whoever having her look-alike. This time, it's Jiraiya that felt that shiver. That in turn made him add a few extra seals on his collection as precaution. Although it may have not have anything to do with his Sanmin status but at least you can say his instincts are sharp. Back to the present when the story is finished, Jiraiya's mouth was left hanging wide open. His hand unconsciously touching his scroll where his prized collections are. Had people that knew him were there, they would have been suspicious. That's because he isn't just a collector, he's actually the number one Kanichi figure collectors on Elemental Nation. Now that he knew whom was responsible, he's having mixed feelings. Had he been sponsoring the Akatsuki this whole time? He thought after hearing Orochimaru's story he wouldn't be surprised but he's obviously wrong. Not only was the kid got himself involved with someone like Orochimaru, he's now somehow had hand with the Akatsuki. What's wrong with Minato's boy? Was he born under a bad sign or something? If it's not Orochimaru it's now the Akatsuki. What's next? Madara? He's not even a ninja, why was he in the middle of these powerful people? Despite the thoughts, he still had yet to close his mouth. Wait a minute they actually made them? He still have problem grasping the fact that it's these notorious Miss Singnans that actually made them. It's something even he had to see to believe. However, Naruto didn't bother answering him that question. Civilian or not, he's not fond of repeating himself. Never mind. Even he was baffled when he first saw his own figure and Sasori would be the last person he think makes it. However, what Nu knew is he paid an extortious amount of Rio for a Tsunade figure in an auction. The moment he saw it, he knew he had to have it. At first, he thought he could use it as an inspiration for his next book. A chibi Tsunade, he had already a lot of ideas from just seeing it. Hence, even if had to compete against a daimyo he's willing to pay extortious amount of money for it. Over time and when more of such figures came out, it became his obsession and also dream to collect all Kanichis on Elemental Nation. To the, super pervert, it would be like a harem. Now that he know whom was responsible he's having a lot of mixed feelings. This is especially true when the group Sasori's in is targeting his godson. Of course, before he knew it was Sasori, he thought the makers a genius thus would be happy to supply him a few suggestions. Considering his hobby, there's little doubt his ideas involve something ecky. Again, as being said there are a lot of mixed feelings. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.